Man, it is so good to see everybody here this morning. If you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and be turning with me to James chapter 2. For those of you who are visiting with us today, or for those of you who haven't been able to be here for the last couple of weeks, that's where we've been anchored is in the book of James. And we've looked at the entire first chapter, and so now we're going to jump into chapter 2. Now I want to begin today with a story. And it's about a young man from Boston who was trying to get on with a bank in Chicago. Well, they asked him for references and he gave them several. And, and one of the references that he gave them was a Boston investment house. And so they checked his references, they contacted this Boston investment house and sure enough man they sung his praises they they couldn't say enough good about him in fact they said man his mother was um, a, a Lowell and his father was a Cabot and even going back further you know into some of his earlier history he had some Peabody's in his family line and so yes definitely we would definitely encourage you to hire this young man well the bank in Chicago sent back your reference was inadequate because we're not planning on breeding this young man. We just want to know if he's a good worker or not. And the reason I told you guys that story is for this, pur this purpose. We can be tempted to view people with the wrong criteria. Are you with me? And, and I'm not just talking about people in the world. I'm talking about those of us within the family of God. Look with me if you will, and I'm not going to put this up on the, the screen. This is kind of a lengthy reading today, so look at chapter 2. Normally I put it up on the screen. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13. It says, My brothers, as believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my seat. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised those who love Him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of Him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now let's stop right there. And I want you to notice what James is trying to point out in our text. And that is this, spirituality and partiality are incompatible. Are you with me? In other words, spirituality and partiality, or you could use the term favoritism, they just don't mix. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, Slate, what do you mean by partiality or, or favoritism? Well, partiality is the sin of showing favor to one person over another, particularly on the basis of external factors such as economic level or ethnic background. Or, or to put it more clearly, 
It's the sin of seeing differences in people that make no difference to God. Are you with me? And that can be a range of, of all kinds of things. It can be race. It can be age. It can be gender. It can be skin color. Or, as in the case of our readers that James is writing to, economic or social status. If you look at the text, what was happening is you would have a rich man who would come into their assembly. And he's wearing these nice clothes. And then a poor man might come in at the same time and his clothes aren't so nice. And so what does he do? The door greeter, you might say, will look to, to the man who's rich. Hey, look, we've got a great seat for you over here. You come sit in this spot. But to the poor man, he says, oh, well, you can go stand over there or you can come sit at my feet. You see what's going on? Favoritism. And it comes in a variety of different ways today. But notice what James says about it in James chapter 2, verse 4. He says, when you do it, when you show favoritism or partiality towards someone, he says, you are judges with what, church? with evil thoughts. In other words, favoritism, discrimination, bigotry, partiality, and you can use any other word you want to plug in there. It is evil. Because it doesn't come from God. In fact, if you get into the New Testament, you'll find that word favoritism used over and over and over again. But this is the only place where it refers to someone other than God. But when it refers to God, it's not saying that God is showing favoritism, but rather just the opposite. God doesn't show favoritism. Let me show you a few passages. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, the, con the conversion of Cornelius. Now, the thing that was so interesting about this conversion is because Cornelius wasn't a Jew. The Jews were supposed to be God's chosen people. But, but Cornelius and his household, they were Gentiles. And so this was a really, really big deal. But God chose to save them. And notice how Peter responds. I now realize how true it is. God does not white church show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear Him and do what is right. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verses 9-11, through 11, where there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. For the Jew first, but then also for the Gentile. What are you saying, Paul? Well, it doesn't matter who you are. What your nationality is, if you do evil, you're going to experience trouble and distress. You're going to be cursed, basically. But he goes on to say, he says, But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. What are you saying, Paul? I'm saying that just as the same is true with those who do evil, the same is true with those who do good. It doesn't matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, if you do good, you will be blessed. And he tells you why. Because God doesn't show what, church? Favoritism. And he goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no what, church? There is no favoritism with him. It doesn't matter if you're a master or a slave. He says, don't mistreat each other. Because God is your master. And God shows no favoritism. And so anywhere favoritism exists, you know that it didn't come from God. And it's evil. It's kind of interesting if you research the church back in the first century in the ancient world. 
The church was really the only place where there was no distraction of race or gender or economic and, and status level. In fact, you might walk into a church or a meeting place and see a master and a slave sitting right next to each other on the same, on the same bench as equals. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for that slave to be a leader within the church and have authority over his master. That wasn't uncommon. They say back in World War I that they had what they called rest houses or, or safe houses. And, and all this took place behind enemy lines, but as you would go into these houses, they would have a plaque that, re that read, Abandon all rank, ye who enter here. In other words, it doesn't matter if you are a general or if you are a private, when you step into this house, you are all on the same level. And that's the way it should be in the kingdom of God. We are equal in the eyes of God. And some of you may say, well, why is that so important for us as a church to model? Why, why is it important that we model equality? I mean, why is favoritism so wrong? Well, James gives us three reasons here. First of all, it misrepresent, misrepresents Jesus. Right? I mean, if, if we're showing favoritism, then we're giving, as Christians, people the wrong idea about Jesus. Because this is what James says. I'm going to read it from a different translation. Verse 1, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people what? Over others. In other words, how can we claim to be a disciple of Jesus? and model a life opposite of Jesus. And let me share with you three things that we see in Scripture about Jesus. Jesus preached impartiality. I mean, He really did. If you look at Luke chapter 14, verses 13 through 14, Jesus tells those He's, he's teaching, He says, listen, He says, when you guys throw a party, when you throw a feast or a banquet, He says, don't, write the, don't invite the rich and, and, you know, those who are high on the social status, he says, invite the poor, invite the lame, invite the, bl in, invite the blind. And he says, if you'll do that, he says, you'll be blessed. You also think about um, the story that he told about the Good Samaritan. We all know that story, right? And, and here's the deal. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They were considered what we like to call half-breeds. They weren't fully Jewish. So they were despised by the Jews. And so Jesus tells this, Jew, this group of Jews a story, including a Samaritan, and guess what? He makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. Also in Matthew chapter 28, remember before Jesus ascended, what did He tell His disciples? I want you to go, and I want you to make disciples of who, church? Of a few people? of just Jewish people, he says, of all nations. Jesus preached impartiality, but he didn't, he didn't just preach it, he lived it. Right? I mean, he practiced it in his own life. You see who Jesus hung with? Tax collectors, prostitutes, those who were considered sinners and, and outcasts of their day. Those who were sick and those who were, who were lame. You think about the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, right? Jesus walks up and He asks for some water and she looks at Him and she, she's like, you, you, you talking to me? I mean, don't you understand? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Samaritan and, and not only am I a Samaritan, but I'm, I'm a woman. And He says, let me tell you about living water. Let me tell you what happens if you have a relationship with me. And he spent some time with her. He didn't, he didn't just preach it, he practiced it. But also Jesus died so that he could bring all men near to God. And not just near to God, but near to each other. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. And I'm going to read this. Again, it's kind of a lengthy reading, but you guys will get the point. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to the Gentiles who were far away from Him and peace to Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. And Paul even goes on to say in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, he says, You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who have been baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ, so that, watch this, so that now there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all what, church? One and where? In Christ. Praise God. We're all one in Christ. And so how can we be a disciple of Christ and look at a certain person or look at a certain group of people and say, I just can't love them? You see, as Christians, what we need to try and do is see people the way Jesus sees people. And here's the deal. When people whether they're walking in our door or whether we see them on the street, we should see them one of two ways. If they are a Christian, we should see them as a brother and sister who is filled with Christ. But if they are not a Christian, we should see them as someone who Christ died for. Therefore, we should love them. And when we don't, we misrepresent Jesus. Number two, when we show favoritism, it misrepresents the law of God. Now, some of you are saying, well, Slate, what do you mean? Well, I think so many times we're tempted to put sins in two groups. Right? I mean, there's the really bad sins over here, and there's the not-so-bad sins over here. The really bad sins would be murder and adultery and, and drugs and, you know, molestation. and I mean, just things we'd say, oh, that, that's terrible, that's horrible. But, but these sins over here, those, those aren't that bad. Like, favoritism, partiality, bigotry, lying. You see, many times we take God's law and we, we kind of view it like it's a menu in a restaurant where we kind of pick and choose what we like. And what James is saying, when we do that, we don't understand the law at all. Because here's what he says in James chapter 2, verse 10. He says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking what, church? All of it. In other words, the law of God is like a glass, like a, a, a pane of glass, right? Look at this pane over here. Look at this window over here by the halls. If I were to take a rock and I were to throw it through that window, would you guys say, well, you only broke just a, a portion of the window? No, you'd say you broke the window. You broke it all. And that's how God feels about His holy will. And so we can't put good sins and bad sins. Yes, I understand that different sins have different consequences. But sin separates us from God. Jesus put it like this. He says, everything in the law can be summed up with these two rules. Love God with everything you've got. And love your neighbor as yourself. And James, it's kind of interesting, if you look at James chapter 2, verse 8, James refers to that second rule, love your neighbor as yourself, as the what, church? You see it? 
the royal law. Now, a lot of people want to know, okay, well, why is he referring to that as the royal law? And people speculate. Some people say, well, because that law was given by the king. It was given by the king of kings. Jesus himself. But here's what I'm leaning toward. It was called the royal law because it rules or reigns over all the other laws. So what do you mean? Well, look at Romans 13, 8, the, 8 through 9. Jesus, or Paul rather, says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to what, church? Love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has what, church? Fulfill the law, the commands. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, which is what, church? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is why partiality is wrong, because partiality says, I get to choose who I'm going to love. I get to choose who my neighbor's going to be. And there are all kinds of things that many times we're tempted to look at to determine that. Again, it can be race, it can be skin color, it can be gender. It can be economic status. It can be what's on your skin, whether it's a tattoo or a piercing. I heard a story a while back about a young man in the 1960s who came into a church building and he was what they considered back then a hippie. He had long hair, he wore beads. His pants were old and worn out and he was barefooted and he walked into the building and he walked down the aisle right in front of the pulpit next to the front pew and he sat on the floor with his legs crossed. And an elderly gen gentleman in the back who was a leader in the church who was dressed very nice he stood up and he got out into the aisle and as he made his way toward the young man sitting in the floor, everyone began to gasp. What's he going to say? What's he going to do? And here's what, the, here's what the elderly gentleman did. He sat right down next to him on the floor for the rest of the services. It's pretty awesome. The Bible says that we've got to treat men like Jesus treated us. And at the very latter part of this text, James begins to talk about what that looks like. He talks about mercy. Folks, how, how can we welcome others? Or how we welcome others reveals the welcome we can expect to receive from God. Now, that doesn't mean James is not saying there that we can earn our salvation because we can't. We can't even do that with mercy. But here's what James is trying to get across here. Just, just look at the text. James chapter 2, verse 13. He says, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others, but if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when He judges you. Now, here's the point he's trying to make there. Mercy, on our part, demonstrates that we understand the mercy that was shown to us. By God. Are we reflecting mercy to others? Are we treating others like Jesus treated us? And then lastly, it misrepresents the value that God places on us. Over a hundred years ago, there was a couple from Boston, and they got off a train. And they went to Harvard University. The husband was wearing an old, worn-out suit. And the wife was wearing a gingham dress. 
And they went to Harvard and they asked to see the president. And the secretary had been trained to, you know, kind of push people out like this. Because they didn't have an appointment, so she said, look, you know, the president's a very busy man. He doesn't have time, really. Um, it, it might be hours before he might have time, before he might be able to see you. And they said, well, then we'll wait. After several hours, the secretary had had enough. She went in to see the president and said, they're not leaving. Could you just talk to them, amuse them for a few minutes so that they will leave? And the president, very frustrated, said, okay, fine, send them in. And so the husband and wife came in. He said, how can I help you? And the wife said, well, our son attended Harvard for one year and then he was accidentally killed. And she said, what we would like to do is set up some sort of memorial in his honor because he loved Harvard University. And the president said, no, we can't do that. I mean, if we let everybody put up statues of people who had died that attended Harvard University, this place would look like a cemetery. She said, I'm not talking about a statue. She said, we would like to erect a building in his name. He, he loved Harvard. And the president looked at their clothes, the old suit, and the gingham dress. And he said, you folks don't understand. He said, we have seven and a half million dollars. Now remember, this was over a hundred years ago. Seven and a half million dollars in buildings here at Harvard. And the wife turned to her husband and she says, is that all it takes to start a college? And they dismissed themselves. And they hopped right back on the train where they went to California and they started Stanford University. That was Mr. and Mrs. Leland Stanford. And the point that I want to make with that story is this. We can't always tell by looking at the outside what a person is really worth. Amen? And let me tell you something else, in God's eyes, we're worth a lot. In fact, here's a poem for you. What's a man worth? Does anyone know? Is he measured by riches, by friend or foe? Can we tell by his virtues, his station in life, his accent, his color, his peace or his strife, the, leg, the length of his hair, the shape of his nose, his smile or his handshake, the cut of his clothes? What's a man's worth? We turn to our guide and Christ gives us his answer. For each man, I die. In God's eyes, we each have infinite value. In fact, in Romans chapter 5, which is one of my favorite passages, this is what Paul writes. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time, and He died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. I want to do something before we close out this morning, and I know that we're getting close to time, but I want us to sing, if y'all could switch that up, I want us to sing the first verses of just two songs. I want to ask you guys to stand with me, if you will. Wouldn't hurt my feelings if you kind of looked around at your neighbor as you sang these two songs today. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the God's Word. We're 
they're part of the family that's been born again, part of the family whose love knows no end, for Jesus has saved us and made us His own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven God's family we're extending the invitation and if you're here this morning and you need to respond for any reason maybe today you want to be a part of this awesome family of God and it truly is a blessing and it is awesome not only because our sins are forgiven in Christ but the walls of hostility have been torn down and those of us who are represented here as the family of God we're all on the same playing level we're all equal with one another and today maybe you wanna you wanna be a part of that family or it may be that today you are a part of that family and there's something you're struggling with. The book of James, the theme, is really about James saying as Christians, we've got to walk the talk. We can't just claim to be Christians. We've got to live it. People have got to see it through the actions that, that we put out each and every day so that we can be a witness for Christ. And so if you need to respond, won't you do so together? We stand this invitation.